This is a video I should have done forever ago. It is what drift car to buy or how to buy a drift car or whatever I decide to title this later. Okay, basically what we're gonna talk about in this episode is how to buy a drift car, how to choose a drift car, like what car, the thought process behind all this. So first I'm, I'm gonna like teach you how to think about it, how to think about it holistically and like in a big picture, and then we're gonna decide like how to break a car down and figure out how much it costs and basically just kind of go over this. Now I used to do this in a classroom session that I teach you in know, like four or five hours, sometimes up here in Fort Worth at the shop. Um, but I figured I could reach so many more people this way. I don't host the classroom session anymore. I just focus on YouTube stuff. So here we go, are you ready? <sighs> ah, okay, all right. First of all, you need to be honest with yourself. Things like this I'm gonna mention. Are you a mechanic? Now. This means, are you not just mechanically inclined, but do you have experience doing this stuff? This better not be wide open on the lens side. Can they see this stuff? Is it in focus? Okay. In focus is very important this time. Okay, so are you a mechanic? That means, can you build a car? Have you already built them? Do you know? If you don't know, this is a no. Now, don't worry. If you are gonna say no, you are still gonna learn to work on cars, but it's gonna be more at your own pace you do not want to start with a full like Pro-Am build or Formula D car. You want to start off slow because your first car is going to have mistakes. It's going to cost too much. You're going to screw up. And you don't want to do that on some crazy build that's going to take you multiple years. As an organizer of drift events, I have seen people nonstop build cars that they think are going to be very simple like a V8 swap. And they'll be sometimes four to five years into the process before they're done. And then by the time they're done, they have a baby, they have a wife, you know, like maybe they have a job that's in the way. They just never get into drifting, which means they spent all this time and money and they never got to have the fun of what they actually set out to do, which is drift. So it's very important not to choose the wrong thing. So if we say no, the types of cars we're going to get are all gonna be basically stock drivetrain. We want something that's not very modified. We want it as close to factory as possible. The things we're gonna, look at our 350Z, like G35. We're gonna look at Miatas. We're gonna look at BMWs. We're gonna look, what else is there, Cy? Mustangs. Mustangs, very good. And if you're mechanically inclined, you, oh, and also S chassis, so like S13, S14. If we're over here, you could then look at modified cars, which you could have a V8 S13, you could have an S13 with a 2JZ and a big turbo. Turbo, big, I don't know how to do that with a little mark. Um, you could have all of these, like, you know, something custom. You do not want that stuff, though, as a new person because you won't be able to maintain it or build it or do anything else. So, very important that you choose the correct list of, like, to be in. Okay, now, let's go over here to this next list. You you have money or you don't. Now you need to be really honest on this because it's gonna matter with a bunch of other things. Say you don't have a lot of money, that means you need to choose a car that is on the tires you wanna do, that's on the type of tracks you wanna do, that if you want a lot, if you don't have a lot of money, you do not want a big turbo 2JZ car that runs on race gas, that goes through you know 20 tires in the vent. You need to choose the correct type of car for you, which is probably a video game Simulator. That's a little bit of a troll, but a little bit not. Like maybe you should spend a lot of time on that because your bang for the buck is going to get better, or is better. All right, you could also do say a 350Z. You know, you could do a bunch of these things in this list, such as the Miata, the, the BMW, the Mustang. You know, like those things open up to you. And if you have money, Possibly you can just skip the mechanical thing and you can buy any car you want because you can afford someone to work on it You know you can you can basically have your cake and eat it too But you will be at the mercy of not having someone or possibly having someone to work on the car at events for you If the car breaks at the event you could be screwed So if you're not mechanically inclined even if you have money Maybe you don't want a crazy car unless you have a mechanic in tow We do have multiple people that drive in the Lone Star Drift series that actually do have dedicated mechanics and they do have money and they do have crazy cars and they like literally cannot operate the cars without the mechanic there. So then they will go back to the lit, like this list where they're not a mechanic and they'll have, you know, like a 350Z. 
But when they do have their mechanic there, then they'll have some crazy S13. That makes sense, Cy? Mm -hmm. Cool, okay. So it's very honest, or like it's very important to be honest with each of these things. If you don't have a lot of money, don't go get something that you shouldn't have. And if you do have a lot of money, know that you'll be spending it to replace yourself as the mechanic or whatever else and how it all works. And this is something that's important to realize, like drifting is becoming like a real form of racing to a lot of people. And it's not evil to go spend, you know, $100,000 racing spec Miata for a year. You know, you can spend whatever you like. You can go spend $100,000 racing carts for a year. Don't blame just because someone chooses to spend a lot of money, you know, drifting, that it's necessarily evil or anything like that. Maybe it does change the punk rock culture or something a little bit, and it does feel weird in some ways that someone would spend so much doing that, but it's their disposable income, it's their choice, don't worry about it. Okay, now let's go over to tra or location. Now if you're in Japan, you have a whole different range of things open up to you, like JZX100, say Sylvia's, Sylvia's, um, what else, Sai? Other big four-door things, like the, uh, what's that, the, the Nissans, the stuff. The Laurels and stuff? Yeah. Say Laurel. Okay, you have all these cars that open up. And if you're in the USA, like maybe Corvettes are cool, um, S13s, S14, oh, S15 down here, which is under Sylvia, we'll put S15. Um, maybe Mustangs, still BMWs. So you can see that depending on location, it's very important what to choose. Because if you're in America, and you want to drift a JZX100 a lot, you're going to have difficulty getting some parts for the thing, such as suspension parts, such as you know specific engine components in the engine bay, um, windows, doors, body panels, fenders, all of those kind of things. It could make it very difficult to drive a JZX100 here if you drive very aggressively and dent the thing up and stuff. So it would be more cost effective in the US and much cheaper to drive a Corvette than it would be a JZX100. So if you had 10 grand, I would rather have a Corvette than a JZX100 in the United States. And if you were to say, have an S15 in the US, it wouldn't be too difficult because you know most of the parts share, but body parts and like steering racks, there's that, that door chime, steering racks and things like that could be, and windshields could be difficult for the S15. It would probably be much easier just to get an S13 or S14. And conversely, if you're in Japan, it could be really difficult to drive a Corvette. You know what I mean? Like you just want to choose what is in your native area that you have available spare, spare parts, um, knowledgeable like shops to help you work on it, all of that kind of stuff. Like if I took my Corvette to Japan and I was having some issues with it, it could be really hard to find, you know, like a throttle pedal and a throttle body and all of those things to toss in an extra like E38 ECUs that we were trying out to go through them and have those available parts to test really quickly. And then also the mechanics that have the mechanical ability to do that. So in America, you should choose a car that makes sense over here. And in Japan, you should make a car that makes sense over there. And maybe you're in Germany and maybe they drift Mercedes and BMWs and that stuff makes sense. And Corvettes don't make so much sense over there. So know your, your location. All right, next, it really matters for what car we choose, the type of tracks we tra like intend to drive. Like say you're up with Chelsea at Park, the E36, ah, uh, E36, M3 is killer for tiny tracks. But like maybe the E36 M3 would not be good for huge tracks that you know you need to go 120 miles an hour on. So you would need something over here, cars that have say 350 wheel horsepower at least. Which means we need to choose cars that are possibly more modified to get there or cars that start with more horsepower. And if we're over here on these little tiny tracks, if we have 600 horsepower, it's just gonna break, it's gonna break axles. Like it might not be that much fun to drive a 600 horsepower car on a tiny track, where the E36 M3 would be way better. So know the local tracks that you're gonna drive a lot and build the car accordingly. And then even if say you drive six tracks a year and five times like they're small tracks and one time it's a big track, maybe you should just focus on having like this car and maybe just kind of not have a, the, the best experience at the big track, but have the best experience at the place you drive the most, if that makes sense. Um, so we want to figure out what tracks we have in our local area that we plan to drive and then build accordingly. Because I do see a lot of people build like say 700 horsepower SRs or you know crazy stuff, 
to come drive in Texas when you really don't need more than about 350 to 400 wheel horsepower to like play in Pro-Am and you don't even need that much in Texas Street Legal. The guy that won Texas Street Legal had a T25 on his car. Um, so yeah, just know your local area and build the car accordingly and don't build something crazy. Next up, we need to budget and this goes back to do you have money and things like that. Tires are really important because say if you have a Miata, you might be dealing with tires that last five times as long on a stock Miata and have 40 or 50 or $60 price tags. I don't even know how much Miata tires cost. You know, like it might be far cheaper to operate a Miata overall than it would be a 350 wheel horsepower and up car, which would take a 265, 35, 18 tire. And a 235, 65, 18 Kenda cost around 80 to $100 a piece in Texas locally, depending on how many you buy, because as you increase volume, it gets cheaper. Um, so you want to know how much you're gonna spend to drive and budget for tires and tire sizes. Because say you go build yourself, as I've seen a lot of people do this, supercharged you know, LS cars with 800 horsepower, rear mount radiator setups and stuff. A, you need really grippy tires for that. B, you're gonna go through a lot of tires and then the course of a couple seasons, the tires could cost more than the entire car. So you really need to think about that when you're budgeting. If you have a lot of money, you don't have to worry about that so much. If you don't, you do. You're like, if you're on a tiny track, you don't need all that tire. You know, like, you just gotta play this game and figure all this out to holistically think about what kind of car you want and then choose it. So, let's take for instance, I am not mechanically inclined. I don't have a ton of money. I have tracks like in Texas, which are both these things. I'm in the USA. Probably the best choice for me would be say a 350Z, a Mustang or S13, maybe a BMW. I probably personally wouldn't do a Miata here unless it was modified and had a turbo. And because I'm not mechanically inclined, I'll probably cross that off. And because I like the G30 or the 350Z more than the G35, I'll probably cross that off unless it's just a joke car that I'm going to build for the bash, which we're going to. Um, and those are the things I'm probably going to focus on. If I had a bit more of a tire budget, I might go for a Corvette. And this Mustang is going to push the tire budget a little bit. So maybe if I am a little bit less money than, you know, like whatever, this might be cheaper than the Mustang. This would be cheaper than the BMW. And like we start to pull out which cars. And then I start to use personal preference to push that farther, if you know what I mean. Because I know maybe I want this more than that or I want the BMW more than that. Maybe I have a great friend that's really comfortable with helping me with the BMW in case I get in trouble. Or maybe I know of one that I want that's a good deal or something like that. But beware the good deal. Because a good deal could cost you a great deal more money. And also, like say I got a good deal on an RX-8. That's a terrible idea. Don't buy an RX-8. Uh, just don't do it. So I'm not even putting those on the list typically because if we did want to, we could have one more thing and we'll put reliability. And if you want yes, you put all of those other cars. And if you want no, you can put RX-8 or RX-7 or anything with a rotary in it. That makes sense? Okay, that's kind of my troll thing for fun. Okay, I have had RX-7s by the way, and I only put them on that list because I actually own them and they went through lots of motors. All right. That gives you an idea of how to think about buying a car. Do not buy a car based upon like um, misconceptions of like, oh, I want this stance low car that I'm gonna take to drift events and this is the coolest looking thing, blah, blah, blah. Only has to have a Jay-Z because that's what I think is the coolest sounding car and all that stuff. Because if you buy the wrong car and you can't take care of that thing or maybe like you're at Ebisu and you can't deal with a low car, you know, like all of these things, like you could have a terrible time where you rip a kit off every two seconds. Like you need the car to be usable. So if you wanna drift and you don't just wanna drive it around like a stance car, you need to pick something realistic. And like a style stance car typically that's dragging the ground can be a disaster and ruin your life. And especially if it's not fast enough to keep up with your friends because you know it's on rubber band 215s and too low anyways, you might not have fun. But if all your friends are on that, feel perfectly fine to do that. Okay, next up. What were we doing for this side, Sai? Oh, we're gonna choose a car. All right, so on this side, we're gonna first choose a 350Z and I'm gonna to explain to you how to do this. So let's take the 350Z. All right, 
We have different versions of the 350Z. We have the 03 to 06, and we have the 07 to 08. All right, this has the HR motor in it, and this has the DE motor in it. And we're teaching you how to pick a car right now and research a little bit. This one makes 287 horsepower, and I forget, I think this one makes 330 or 320 or something. I don't remember, but say it's something like that. Um, we now know that this thing is going to be kind of slow and gutless because I've driven these, and this thing's going to be pretty darn good. So if we're going to get this, we're going to need to modify it and probably put you know $1,000 or $2,000 into engine parts to get it up to there. But we'll see in a second that it's cheaper to just buy the HR than this and have more fun. So it's very important to buy the correct one unless you're very cash strapped. Um, so here, let's go down here. The typical one of these in Texas costs between 800 for a piece of crap like flood damage one or something. We have multiple drivers that have $800 ones up to say $5,000. Um, these are basically stock ones that are not drift ready. And then for these, we have people on the piece of crap salvage title ones, which is an Aaron special, up to maybe about $10,000. Now, this one, if you try and get it modified over to this one to make the same horsepower and stuff, it's going to basically cost the same. And this one is going to be more reliable with updated parts such as the transmission and engine and everything else, um, with less miles and stuff potentially and just be a better deal. I would go for this one, especially because this one might have a scratchy third gear or something because the old school transmission. And you'll probably be better off after performing the maintenance on this one to just get the newer one with all the better parts. That's my opinion. You can fight me over it. All right, so now that's kind of the price range. Let's talk about real quickly what you need for it. I would think you need coilovers, although you could drive it without. You need a little bit of angle, which is just, um, spacers, rack spacers, and some cutting. I don't remember if you need tie rods with that. I haven't had one of these in a while. You need a diff, which could be welded, or LSD. And you're gonna need, uh, what else, a seat, because you'll slide around in the stock seat. It's not completely necessary, but I would suggest it. What else do we need, Sai? I think that's most of it. I think I'm missing something. This is going to be about a thousand bucks installed unless you do it for the welded route. This is going to be about a thousand bucks. This is going to be like a hundred bucks or something. I don't even remember. Um, and this will probably be like 400 bucks for a decent seat. You're going to be in the range of about, uh, two to three thousand dollars or maybe 1500 to 1500 to $3,000. Let's say to get this thing up and running plus any maintenance. Um, which means this car is suddenly going to cost, you know, probably about 3,000 to 8,000 to be ready to go on track. And this one's going to cost more like 6,000 to 13,000. And you start to see the range. These are the finished prices ready to go. If you can find a finished car to take out, it's much better a lot of the time to just go find one that's maybe, you know, like already prepped because you, I'm sure you can find a prepped HR 350Z ready to go on track for probably about seven to eight thousand dollars, seven to eight. It's better to do that than to like you know put it together yourself. It's better to just go get it out of the way and buy one completely ready. Um, and it's probably going to be seven to eight. And people ask me all the time like, Aaron, how much can I get an HR 350Z that's ready to go? And I'm like, well, you might be able to find one three grand, you know, like as and they want to be as cheap as possible. And I'm like, oh, you should probably buy this one for seven or eight. They're like, no, I want the three thousand dollar one. I'm like, ah. Eh. You should probably just buy the one that's done for you know seven to eight. That has all the parts on it. You can test drive. You can make sure it functions well. <clears throat> Take it on track today, then going and building stuff. But we get really sucked into these really low prices, if you know what I mean. So it's whatever. But that kind of gives you an idea of what it takes to get one of these out on track with the minimal parts. This is the minimal parts list, I think, unless I'm forgetting something, which I always am. Arms. Adjustable Oh, we arms. need adjustable arms. Good job. You'll probably spend $500 on arms making them adjustable so you can align the thing. Um, and there you go. That's a basic 350Z build. I would think that this is an excellent starter drift car. And even someone like, say, David Mesker, who's been driving, won our Pro-Am series in 2017, came out and drove our Texas Street Legal series. He had just as much fun in a Texas Street Legal car as he did the Pro-Am car. And the Texas Street Legal car probably cost, I don't know, 20% of what the other car you know, cost. When he blew a motor, 
And his Pro-Am car, I think a motor, like a 3.4 liter Stroker 2J is like 25 grand from Tyne Motorsports. Um, that cost, <coughs> that motor cost more than his entire um, drift car for the 350Z. So like the budget disparity between having like a nice HR 350Z to go drifting in versus a full on Pro-Am car is wild if you're trying to win Pro-Am. Also, you could literally, if you expanded your budget, you know, say up to 10,000 or whatever, you could get the cleanest HR like you've ever seen. You could get an incredibly nice one that looks like it's off the showroom floor. That's cool because you'll want to daily this. It'll have air conditioning. It'll be really nice. Oh, I should have put that in the daily list. <laughs> All right, let's do one more list on that other page. Do you want to daily it? The answer is yes versus no. This means you probably don't want an S chassis, so, oh, I put that in the wrong thing. You probably don't want an S13. If you're over here, 350Z is good, Corvette is good, BMW is good. You know, over here, you probably don't want an A86. I probably wouldn't want a Miata to daily personally, but I'm kind of tall and I'm kind of old, so I wouldn't want these things. So, you know, that's one more thing to choose. Also, another one, if you're not going to daily it, that requires a truck and trailer. It's wrong side. Ah, <laughs> anyways, look at this, look at this. Boom, modified. So, you know, you could get really expensive with a Pro-Am build if you're not going to daily it and all this other stuff. Because if you're not going to daily it, you're going to need to, oh, you need a daily too, but I guess that could be the truck. Um, you need all of these other parts if you want to play the big boy game. So getting into drifting, if it's your first drift car and you need me to explain all this to you, I would really suggest something like this. Let's look at something else real quickly. Let me break down, we'll break down two more cars for you. All right, we're gonna break down a BMW real quickly and then we'll break down like a Pro-Am car. So a BMW, we're gonna try and be quick about this. If we're doing something basic and we're not you know, throwing away huge amounts of money so we're not gonna do big turbo builds and everything else. We're gonna look at E36, E46, E90. We're gonna talk about the 325, the 328, um, and the M3. The 325, the 330, and the M3. And the 335, and the 330. All right, let's chat about these real quickly. So again, this whole video is about choosing the correct car. And realistically, these aren't that far apart in price. And E36 M3 is about $3,000 to, let's say, 10,000. I just sold a really nice E36 M3 with a different diff, a bunch of parts like bolt-ons, made about 200 and something, a low 200 wheel I would think, but it had a clutch package, a flywheel, it had suspension, it had arms, it had a different ring gear in the back to make it faster, it had a really nice interior, and I sold that for $4,000. So you can absolutely find nice M3s for not too crazy. The, you know, 3,000 range is gonna be pretty beat, but you can find them for under 10. A 328 is going to probably be 1,000 for something you actually wanna to own to 3,000. And a 325 is gonna to be too slow in my opinion when these other cars exist, if that makes sense. Because if you're gonna get a 328 for 1,000 bucks, why get a 325? Does that make sense? There's no reason to go down that road. And it's also the same thing almost with the 328. If you can find an M3 for that cheap, you should realistically, unless you're just really abusing cars and stuff, just get an M3 unless you're on a very tiny track at home. Choosing a E46 platform, I would again say just stay away from the 325s. Hey, my marker changed colors somehow. Weird. All right, so I would say stay away from the 325s because you can find the 330s for probably, you know, $1,500. I mean, you might find it way cheaper, you know, up to 4,000 for a decent one. And the M3s are gonna be probably 6,000 to 20,000. And what's really weird about the E46 M3s, I've never really loved driving them that much, even though they have a much better motor than the 330s. I'm, I kind of am of the opinion, if you're gonna go get an M3, you should, because they don't have a lot of torque, you should probably just go get something else for drifting. Maybe a Corvette, maybe a Mustang, maybe an S chassis. 
something else, because it's not you know, like the most cost effective thing, I would probably either get a 330 and the E46 lineup or nothing else. So I would probably cross those out unless you wanted to build a really, really serious drift car, but we're kind of in the budget range. So, so far we have these two, this one, and for the E90 platform, I don't know. Um, I haven't really driven the 330s much in manual, and the 335, I actually owned a drift one, and I've driven another one with Wise Fab, and another one with, I've driven about four to five of them, three of them actually drifting, um, mine had a welded diff and a bunch of mods, but typically they always overheat after, say, two laps and take 10 minutes to cool down, which means they're kind of a non-starter no, ma no matter how much you get them for. A couple years ago, I got mine for $4,000 and I put maybe about $2,500 of stuff into them because they have incredibly cheap parts. Um, but it, it just wasn't usable and it wasn't that much fun to drive. I had more fun driving a 330 drift car than I did in the 335. Although the 335 does have really good power and stuff, if you can get it to not overheat in two laps, we did have oil cooler and radiator on them and stuff. So I don't know what to do about that. But if somebody figures this out, we were thinking it was maybe the turbo housings were too small and causing the oil to get baked. Um, that would be a viable platform. Um, these are getting really cheap. I see these down in the $3,000 range but they're very rare for a manual. Uh, so I would probably think this would be really cool because it's such a new car, but I would probably say E46 330 is my favorite chassis out of these because it's very similar to this car, but it's newer, has a great motor in it. Um, yeah, I would probably say this is my favorite one looking at all the options and it's more disposable than this one. This one's lighter though and a little bit more simpler, so maybe I would go with this, but both of these are the best best choices for this. I would say it's that and that. And if you were to talk to like a friend of mine, Chelsea Denofa, he would say go for this. He would say the E36 M3 all day long, but as the prices for these vary a lot, and if you don't have you know an acceptable one in your range, these are really cool. Okay, so that's kind of how we think about that. And then to modify these, you need to figure out what modifications or what problems these cars have. Because you have heard of subframes tearing and all of these different things. Research the specific year and model and everything that you're gonna go after. And these cars, I would leave the drivetrain basically 100% stock, except maybe a clutch if you need it. Um, I would not do a straight pipe or anything like that. It'll make it sound awful and make you hate to drive it. I wouldn't really gut the interior. I kind of like having the interior in those cars. It makes them feel good. A nice set of arms some coilovers to align the things. They have like $50 uh, angle kits for those. I don't super recommend them, but if you're being really cheap, it's a really cheap way to do it. A racing seat and then something to make the e-brake work, work properly, either a hydro one or make the cable one work well, and you're basically done. Um, and there's also plentiful stock wheels for those things that look pretty cool. I think they're pretty cool. So that's how I would choose a BMW if I wanted a BMW. And as we went through each type of other platform, we could make similar like questions. And say I don't want a cheap one. Say I'm not gonna be happy with stock power. This was about stock power. If we start talking about, you know, like I want 500 horsepower, you know, like this whole thing changes drastically. If you want 500 horsepower, you're like, I'm gonna cross that off immediately. Uh, this might become more interesting because you could do a single turbo swap because this motor is super strong. If you want 500 horsepower, suddenly the 330 goes out the window because those blocks don't take any power and they break before that. So suddenly you're back over here. All these E36s are on the, on the, you know, like the list again. Um, so you know, like you need to decide exactly what you want for your power range and make something. And then suddenly the M3 is back on the list too at 500 horsepower. Um, yeah. So basically think about also the availability of cars in your area. Because if you're up in, say, Canada, the E36s might all be rust buckets and you need to do something newer. And then, obviously, with depending on track, if you're on a one track, you know, 500 horsepower is ridiculous and blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's do one more car real fast. Huh? Next up, let's do a Pro-Am car for real quick and just see how they add up so fast. So let's talk about, let's do a Pro-2 car for fun because a lot of people build their Pro-Am cars as a Pro-2 car. And we're gonna go the not cheap route. We're gonna buy new parts and we're going to pay somebody to do the work. Um, and we're gonna choose an S13. 
So an S13 roller, how much is an S13 roller that's not complete garbage? A thousand bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say a thousand bucks. We're gonna grab a 2JZ from a shop that's built. So a 2JZ long block built by a shop. Probably 10 grand plus. All right, coilovers. We're gonna build nice coilovers. So let's say 2,500 for coilovers. Coilovers. Let's do wise fab front and rear. Wise fab front and rear is gonna be $4,000. Let's do arms. Oh no, that's all the arms actually. We're done with that. All right, let's do the rest of the engine bay. So let's say a Garrett GTX Turbo, um, GTX Turbo, that's 2,300 bucks for a big boy one. Let's do E85 fuel system with an ECU, ID injectors. The ID 1000 injectors or 2000 injectors for this motor are like $2,000 or something. E85 dual pumps with surge tank and all that stuff. It's gonna be another thousand bucks. Um, the ECU is gonna be, you know, like 2000 bucks for a nice one. So very quickly with all the lines and stuff, we're up to like say 4,000 bucks probably. No wait, I undershot that, 5,000 bucks. We're gonna need a nice exhaust manifold and everything in the engine bay, such as intercooler, maybe an intake manifold, all that crap. So let's say 5,000 bucks up there. Um, we'll just put engine bay. To have a nice shop build an FD legal cage is probably gonna be 3,500 bucks for a nice cage. That's not, you know, just your cheap hookup thing. Cage. You'll probably want some tube work and stuff for bumpers and all the other stuff. Tube work, let's say 2,000 bucks to have all that done. Rear mount radiator setup, let's say, oof. with labor and stuff to do that, you're probably about $4,000 to do a nice one, um, paying someone to do the, that. Um, we haven't put labor really on anything except the cage and the tube work and stuff, so that's gonna be separate. Uh, it's gonna be need to be tuned, it's going to need wheels, you're probably gonna need, what, 20 wheels to do FD or something like that? So what is that? If they're a thousand bucks a set, Four in a set, that's five sets, is that right? We'll just say 5,000 bucks in wheels. Uh, you'll need probably paint or vinyl. We'll just put 1,500 down for that, or vinyl. Wrap, 1,500. What else do you need? I'm looking over at that car. FIA seats with Hans. Seats. The one in that car right there, $1,500 each, that's $3,000. Harnesses and stuff, we'll just add those in and just say 3,500 with harnesses. Oh, but we need seat rails. Let's put safety stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's put safety stuff. That's gonna be rails, halon. We're probably about 5,000 for all that. Um, Do I put harnesses? Oh, you need your Fire Hans extension. device. I don't remember Hans device. Uh, halon is uh, that. Um, what else do we need? A body kit. Oh, body kit. So you're gonna be with fenders and body kit for like the Super Doof back there. Super Doof is 1400 bucks and fenders are gonna be another 800 or something. So you're about 2200 for the kit. Put the kit. What else do we need? A hood probably that's carbon and Lexan. So just put another 1500 bucks for Lexan. Just put lightweight stuff. What else? I would say miscellaneous stuff is gonna be another like for drive shaft. Oh, we don't have a transmission. We'll just put dog box. Stuff. Dog box and clutch. That's gonna probably be $7,000 for decent stuff for all that with an adapter plate and stuff. Boop. Okay, so I would say there's an additional $10,000 in small parts that we haven't put on at the minimum. And then I'm gonna say 20, 20 grand in labor to put all this together. So we're at uh, 10,000, 11,000, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, 25, 30, 35, 40, 44, 46, 51, 53, adding that together, that's 55, 62, 72, and then with labor, probably about 90 something, like 92. So we're over $92,000 to build a car like that, of you know, like nice quality, buying nice parts without all the hookup stuff. Um, obviously, if you got a Junkyard JZ, 
you did a lot of work yourself, you know, like you didn't, you know, you traded parts. Um, this was engine stuff. You know, you bought a roller that was much more prepped. Um, you would be below this number. And if you're gonna go crazy, you could easily be way over this number, obviously. Um, and then trackside support and all that stuff could be way more. But we're just giving you an idea of like how much you can go build a Pro 2 car. And if you were to talk about like big level Pro 2 cars, this, the ones with like 3.2 liter Titan motors and stuff, that motor is gonna be 25,000. Um, let's talk about, hmm, what else would get up there on the crazy ones? Some of the fancy manifolds could get really expensive. Yeah, like those Titan manifolds are crazy. Anyways, you just start very quickly seeing that just bumped our total up to over 107, I think. I'm doing all this math in my head, by the way. It could be wrong. But like, we just bumped it up 107 by buying like a name brand engine from Titan Motorsports. You know, full done long block for a three, four. And as we adjust things around, you know, like you can just keep going crazier. Say you want a sequential transmission, you know, like, you know, you just bumped it up another like five to $6,000 at least. Um, say you want MoTeC, which a lot of the cars run, you just bumped it up another 10,000. So we're about $120,000 with MoTeC. MoTeC could be another, like, actually I'm probably undershooting that. It's probably another $20,000 in MoTeC or something with all the wiring and stuff. So anyways, this is starting to budget the crazy cars. So when you see a lot of guys running around with crazy cars right now, like say the ESR car that we have behind us, or say David Mesker's car, or for another example, um, the Maxxis car in our series, or Adam LZ's car, some of those cars are wildly more expensive than this even. You know, like they could easily start running double that very quickly, especially when you're powder coating chassis, you know, doing things that you get no business like uh, getting discounts or hookups on because it's very, you know, odd stuff. Or you start getting, you know, like, you could paint the entire car and then have $3,000 of vinyl on top of it. Like the ESR car right there, I have no doubt that's probably a $1,500 to $2,000 at the minimum um, printed out thing installed by a professional company. And if you're gonna need to be at an event, you need multiple full versions of that with doors already vinyled up as well. So you're buying multiple versions of the whole thing vinyled, you know, a whole nother body kit and hood and stuff. So that when you wreck the car at the event, you can put it together quickly. And this does not cover the operating expense of stuff. So this is just kind of like what a Pro 2 build is. So you need to realize this and then realize when I was saying $5,000 for a 350Z, we are 20 times less than a really cool, big power built car that you see all the time on the internet. Okay, is there anything else to cover, Cy? That should be it. That should be it. And don't forget about tires. Tires are gonna be an incredibly big part about drifting and that's you need to budget the for these. That's not even in here. Yeah, that's not even in the budget. Like, and we do have, Drivers, by the way, that easily go through 100 tires a year. If you do see like me drifting in the Lone Star Drift Channel, I go through about 100 tires a year. I do, I don't know how many in Ebisu, maybe like 20 or something like that, especially when I'm buying for like Nick who won the last two years. Um, I bought probably 15 for him or something like that. I'm not sure exactly how many, but you know, we're dealing with me doing that many, so I might maybe buying 30 tires over there, 35. And then I go through typically about 60 here and then sometimes up to 90 here. So it just varies. And when I was driving competitively in D1 and stuff like that, I was going up to 200 tires a year. I was going up to 200 tires a year when I was driving in D1 and Nopi and things like that. But luckily I had a full tire sponsorship back then. So it encouraged me to go drive more because I got free tires. So anyways, thank you very much for holding the camera so long, Cy. I will see you later, YouTube. Thanks for sticking around. This is the perfect time to thank Kenda Tires. Without Kenda Tires, we would not have tires that last so long and keep us on track so long at Lone Star Drift and at all other like drift events around the world. Thank you so, so much, Kenda Tires. That's it, everybody. Good night. Bye. Man, this daily vlogging takes a lot of effort. I don't know if I can keep it up. It's literally like four days in a row. How in the heck do vloggers do this? Check out how legit my new GoPro mount is. We're gonna see if I can even drive like this. Uh, oh God, it already fell. I should have just taped it like to my face.